Karen Lawton Dunn, and we have a few people here in person. And if you're watching online, either today or at a later date, uh, welcome. I appreciate you inviting me here today. And so we're going to talk about, I work in the graduate college and I do the career services in the graduate college. So as an interdisciplinary major in HCI, you really are open to coming to the graduate college and, and working with my office, which consists right now of me, one person. And I do have um, a, a few little grad students working on different projects, but we're we're redesigning the program this spring. Um, I had a new supervisor uh, coming in January that I just had. And so now what we're developing is similar to the CCE so that we'll have career consultants, uh, similar like they have speaking consultants and that, um, that will help with doing one-on-one -on -one appointments so that we can reach more students. So this spring, I'm spending a lot of time on developing the curriculum for the training for those career consultants. And it's making my one-on-one -on -one appointments um, a lot less. So I'm trying to send out webinars and things like this will be helpful to get the main information across to people. So today we're gonna talk about how to find a job in HCI. That was just kind of the basic concept and it sounds so simple, but it's not, as you all know. So Michael, you're in mechanical engineering and HCI, right? And what was your HCI and what was your other majors? Um, I'm just majoring on HCI. In, in just HCI. In HCI, yeah. okay. Hi, come on in. And Angeline, what were your, what is your major with? Do you have a co-major with other departments? Um, no, but I'm from the design department. You're from design. Okay. Sorry to put you on the spot, but your HCI and what other departments are you? Design. Design. Okay, great. So we're going to have a lot of different people. There could be people I've worked with education and HCI and uh, just a variety. I think I've seen it all. It's been pretty crazy. So I, I love this major. Um, and I'm just going to say that being an interdisciplinary graduate student is what I was when I was in graduate school a long time ago. Then they called it general studies. But I had three different um, areas of study. And mine was adult education, family and consumer sciences education, and ag education. So that was more like leadership is what I tried to do it. So there's no title for general graduate studies in adults, all those different educations. I worked in extension for a while. And since then, later you'll be able to look at my LinkedIn, you'll see that I am a very eclectic person as far as job titles. And it makes it really hard to look for jobs. And I think that's one thing that you guys are gonna see is that it's hard to just go in. You can't just write mechanical engineer, right? Because that's not exactly what you do. So um, part of this is really trying to figure out what are some keywords that you, you can claim as your titles, you know? And that's the hardest thing that I'm still dealing with on my degree. Um, I just wanted to tell you that the QR code are the handouts. And I will send those to Amanda so that you can get these slides and have all that resources, but you also have access uh, to that box. And I think there's another um, document in there. So today we're going to try to talk about kind of networking, why and how you do that, um, how to use LinkedIn to help you get this job search, uh, how to search job titles and figure out what job titles. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about career fairs and then just other things that we do within the office of the career services, okay? And, you know, I'm pretty, flex I'm very flexible actually. So if you're online or you're in person and you have a comment, please feel free to just ask me. You can blurt, I blurt all the time. So you can, don't even have to raise your hand. Um, but if you're online and wanna put it in the chat, Amanda's watching the chat. Uh, or you can even take yourself off mute. I have not a problem with that. So uh, so first of all, I just want to talk about what networking is. And as some people have probably seen this, seen me present on some of these things I kind of cover at every type of workshop because I think there are basics that you need to know. Um, but when we talk about networking, a lot of times we say, yeah, I, I went to an event and I met some people and I got some cards, right? And that's really not networking. That is really just connecting. It's when you meet somebody, okay? So when you've met somebody, whether it's at a conference, whether it's at an event that you've had on campus, whether you've been in a online virtual meeting and met some people and said, hey, let's exchange LinkedIn's or emails. 
that's really just connecting. Networking is really when you follow up, when you take that extra step to send another email, to schedule a time maybe to talk, to really have a conversation about a field of study or whatever. And I really think that networking is the key to getting a job right now. And it's not going to happen in the next two weeks. It's something that you need to start doing slowly. And eventually you're going to get those connections that are going to come up and people will find you. It's it's really weird how it happens, but it does. Um, so what we talk about that the goal in networking is meet professionals in the field. When I think of when you're job searching, that's the goal of networking, meeting professionals, meeting representatives from companies. It might be recruiters. It might be other UX designers. It could even be accountants from companies that you're interested in because we just want to get your name into the company, okay? And learning about the professional world from people that are currently doing the job. So this is where networking is, where you really need to start talking to people that are already working and find out, you know, what are the titles at your company? Um, how did you find your job? And those are what we call informational interviews. And I'm gonna talk about that too. So just remembering that when you do this networking, the worst thing that you can do is go up to somebody or start an email with, hi, my name's Karen and I'm looking for an internship. They're going to turn around and run or they're not going to respond to your email because they don't know how to get you an internship. You know, even if you were to come up to me and look, want a job at Iowa State, I would be like, I don't know, go and apply online, right? Go to work day and apply. I might say, you know, what department it is. I might say, hey, I do know somebody in that department. Let me email them and see if they are still accepting applications or and I could say, you know, I could let them know that you're applying and I know you and that maybe they could be able to look at your resume. However, even at Iowa State, it's becoming so computer automated that the people that are on the hiring committee don't always get to see all the candidates that have applied. So it's making it more and more difficult for those small world connections um, to be able to help you through those, you know, gates. And that's what, that's what is really hard. A lot of these jobs that you're going to see posted have already been kind of earmarked for somebody that maybe they were, they were doing an internship. And so they were first dibs on that. And they kind of wrote the job description with that person in mind. Um, a lot of those are just not really open to the general public. So especially full-time jobs. Internships, it's a little bit less like that. Um, but that's sometimes why it feels like you're not getting anything. And it doesn't mean you're not qualified when you're not hearing from them. It just means that you need to get yourself be seen by people. Okay. So I want to talk, have, have you, I know, Couple of you have heard of applicant tracking system. Have either of you heard of what applicant tracking system is? Okay. Now I hear. Do I need to? Un Do you have your speaker on? I don't. The one person just joined the. Audio. Okay. Good. So that's probably why. All right. I thought maybe it was myself. I've done that before. <laughs> So applicant tracking systems are really important to understand. Workday is an applicant tracking system. So what has been around, these have been around for a lot longer than I ever knew they were. It's a computer that whenever you're uploading your resume and you have to attach it right as a file, and then you go back in and you see the job description or you see the job application and you look and you have to retype everything in. That means your resume was not read by the computer. And that's why it feels like such a waste of time every time you apply for something. Because when that's not read, you have to completely re-enter everything, copy and paste. You have a lot more opportunities for mistakes to happen. Sorry, I have a, I have a loud voice. So um, you have an opportunity for more mistakes to happen when you're copying and pasting in or forgetting things. It just doesn't scan in well. So when you when you haven't gotten anything in there, you know it hasn't scanned. So with applicant tracking systems, let me see if I can get this to go. Okay, it, what has happened is now companies are using research-based data to make these decisions on how they're gonna hire people. 
So they're using data analytics and algorithms. And I am not a computer coder, <laughs> don't even know how to code at all, but I understand algorithms enough to know that what we need to do is make your resume friendly to these applicant tracking systems so it's read and scanned in correctly. And then we need to get you seen by recruiters. There's a new word that's not new anymore that's called passive recruiting. When Iowa State added Workday, they actually added passive recruiters on to our HR department. And passive recruiters are the recruiters that are just out and usually digging around on social media, LinkedIn, and trying to find people to apply for jobs. So they're not just sitting back anymore and waiting for people to apply for jobs because everything's so electronic anymore. It's hard to get find people. And so they actually have people out there searching LinkedIn, searching ResearchGate, searching all these places and trying to decide who would be a good person to contact would be a good fit, might be a good catch. And what they're trying to do is not have to call everybody because it's so time consuming. So they're trying to look at ways. So they look at keywords. This is really cost effective for them, right? They're not spending a lot of time. Places like Google will get 40 to 50,000 applications a week or more. And so there's no way that a human is ever going to be able to read all those. So just know that when you upload that resume into a job, even at a small company, it is not likely being read by a human. The very first person, the very first rounds of interviewing or of going through the search and applying for that job are probably going through a computer. And that's where the frustration begins and that's where the frustration ends right there. Uh, so what I have is um, I have an example of what an ugly, what I call an ugly resume. It just means that it's very plain. OK, they only um, they only read text documents. So those graphic resumes that you have that I call look pretty, the computers hate them. All right. They only will read a text box. So I can give you a word document that's simply a word text. There's no columns. There's no formatting, it's just reverse chronological, and that will scan in. I've used mine and scanned it into Workday. Uh, the only thing that didn't scan up on mine was the beginning and end dates of my jobs as well, but all my bullets scanned in perfectly. I was just like, I was very excited to see that because, um, you know, it's been a long time since the resume has scanned in and not had to retype everything in it. So um, the other thing to remember is that a lot of these companies, and this is even quadrupled or even more than that since 2020, is that a lot of our interviewing has gone through virtual. And a lot of times you're having to record your interview before uh, you're not even talking to a human, right? You're just recording it to the camera. And so that is even running through the applicant tracking system. They're actually transcribing your spoken word into the written word that's going through that applicant tracking system for keywords. And then they're using artificial intelligence to look at your eye contact, to me, I'm a hand talker, you know, they're going to find out all those things from AI. And so that's why if you do have a disability, let's say people that have maybe Tourette's or, or stuttering or different things, those are things that you will want to let them know before interviewing, because then that will tag that so that they make sure they don't run that through the AI and it might throw that off. Um, it's really not a problem, though, for people with accents is what we've been told because they're using Google um, Analytics and Google speech to text or whatever. And, you know, they've been using that around the world. So um, I really haven't seen that to be a big problem with as far as uh, somebody with uh, real ac heavy accents that that's really able to pick that up. So but, you know, there's always ways that things are still probably bias, that I'm implicit bias. So I just want to show you, just to get an idea, a, rec a recruiter, and this is probably an older version. I haven't been able to find a newer version, but this is what recruiters in the er, probably 15 years ago were given is that here's the person's name that we've blacked out and they've been getting a, a report within their company that says, here's the person's name, Here's how many stars is based on how their resume scanned in and how well maybe their, their uh, salary fit. Here's a work availability column, track record, resume is attached. And even here, it might show a code for education. So they don't even see your major. 
They just see a code, right? And we don't know if that code means yes, it fits or no, it doesn't, or if it means it is UX, right? So we don't even know what that means. And so recruiters have found these to be very cumbersome for them because they know that the person down here with the five bright stars or the four bright stars are not necessarily the best candidates for the job. They know that this person with one star could be the very best candidate, but it just didn't scan in well and the applicant tracking system didn't read that well. And so that's what was frustrating for recruiters and still remains to be. So back in 2016, which I guess now seems forever ago, but I started this job in 15, 2015, when um, LinkedIn was purchased by Microsoft, Microsoft and LinkedIn added what we call this LinkedIn recruiter. So LinkedIn is pretty expensive to buy the business version, right? The, the one step up to get the LinkedIn recruiter is very expensive. I don't even have any idea, but it's very expensive to do. But a lot of these companies are doing that because now they're giving those data analytics ability to the recruiters and they can go in and do the searching. But when you notice over here, they're searching, they're gonna be searching for a job title uh, they can location, search by skills. They can even do and where people went to school. And I know there's more down there that I haven't even seen that they can search by. But the big thing is job title and skills. Well, when we look at graduate students, a lot of you are putting graduate research assistant, right? Or teaching assistant or graduate student. But that's not something they're searching for, right? In the job description. So this is where I have kind of come up and I've learned this obviously from a variety of different groups that I keep following, how to professionalize your title. Um, and so instead of being a graduate student, maybe you are a UX designer graduate student. So if you don't have a, an assistantship and you're just doing research, you can claim I'm a UX designer graduate student. It doesn't have to be research assistant. And that way you have a place on your resume to place hold your research that you're doing now and the skills you're building. And then we wanna make sure that you have all these skills and the skills every week LinkedIn is changing this. And so I did some new screenshots today because there's some new things on LinkedIn that has this on there. But this is one of the reasons why LinkedIn is so really required to be in the job search because um, indeed.com doesn't have the ability for this. Glassdoor doesn't have the ability for this. Only LinkedIn right now has the ability for this. Doesn't mean in another week, there's not something else that's going to come up. Uh, Twitter is also helpful to like get your name out. Uh, but as far as searching people with their qualifications, LinkedIn, what we say is that 72% of our recruiters right now are using LinkedIn at some time during the recruitment. I think the number is higher. I would say it's more like 95% are probably looking at LinkedIn before they would call you into an interview. They will all Google your name. Okay, so at least at a minimum, they're going to Google your name. So you need to go out and Google your name and see who else is the same name, what comes up first. LinkedIn, what's wonderful is that if you have a LinkedIn profile, that always comes up before most anything else, even Facebook or Twitter accounts, Instagram, it comes up at the top. So that is another reason why you want it out there. Keep an eye for people with other names. I've run into students that have had lots of problems with names that people that they match and they've had um, legal issues or careers that maybe aren't quite so uh, something you want to promote to your new boss that we had to be careful about. Um, you know, I kept the statistics. I just happened to pull down that statistic of 675 million in February of 2020. Little did I know that in less you know month that the world would shut down. So now we're up to 900 million users worldwide. Um, the number of companies keep increasing daily. Um, only 3 million users share content weekly. So the thing I hear from a lot of people, especially faculty is, I don't have time to be on LinkedIn. I don't have time to do posts and things. There are only 3 million out of 900 million that are sharing something weekly. That means liking a post, sharing a post, commenting on something. It doesn't take long to go in and do that. 
right? And on this statistic of 3 million has stayed consistent for this last three years. Um, I looked again and this 3 million, I thought certainly it has to go up with 900 million users. They're still saying 300, 3 million. So you're able to get in that top 1% very, very easily or higher. Um, eight people are hired on LinkedIn every minute now. So they're using LinkedIn to do that. And the one thing you probably don't realize is that LinkedIn is now 20 years old. And I have been on LinkedIn personally for about 17 years. So don't ask me how I found it. I'm really, like I said, I, I'm not a, a computer geek, but I love LinkedIn because I'm a networker. So it has been out there for a long time. So one of the things I just want to talk about is a little bit on LinkedIn and how to use that. So when you're in LinkedIn, when you come over here, you're going to see a place where you can put in a title of a name or in the job search area. And these are all the different ways that you can search. So you can search by human factors engineer. You can search by a person. You can search by jobs, posts, schools. I made it a little bigger over here. Events. You can also go by location up here. You can type in Des Moines area, United States will come up um, and then by connections. And so even when you go behind here, behind this screen there, there's some other places where you can revise your search even more into, I wanna know human factors engineers at Bear, uh, Bear uh, Corporation. And there's a lot of different bears, right? There's a lot of agriculture, a lot of different ones, but you could search by a company name. So that's one way that you can just to start searching and looking and seeing if you know people, find companies, um, looking at job titles. You can also go into LinkedIn. And then we looked in here and did Olathe, Kansas, because I knew this job came up. And it's just really been within the last three months because I've been working with HCA majors since I started um, in 2015. But it's been in the last couple of years that I've really seen difficulty of HCA students finding those jobs and being able to find the titles of them. However, in the last six months, even four months, I'm seeing more and more jobs come across LinkedIn that are UX, UI, human factors, HCI, and those are actually the keywords that are in there. So that's really been making me happy because um, before I knew that I was having this meeting with you, I had talked to your, the major professor last fall and sat down with virtually with them and talked about how can we help HCI people get these jobs and find these careers. And so I've been really kind of trying to follow these careers. When you put into your search in LinkedIn, human factors, go down and turn this alert on right there. When you turn that alert on, that now will tell you when a job pops up that has any of those keywords in there. So we have human factors engineer, Maybe we want to say human factors. Is there another term that you can think of? A title? What, what else besides engineer might they use? Human factors. Maybe they might say HCI engineer. Okay. So HCI engineer, type that in, turn that alert on. This alert thing is so sensitive that even if you make a word plural, you need engineers then you want to make another search on it. So that's how sensitive the search is. And so you could have... 20 easily searches in there. So you might do UI UX engineer search. You might do UI engineer, UX engineer, and all of these different combinations you want to put in and share that. And so that's why I'm saying is that you're going to get this handout that's going to walk you through all these step by step. So you don't have to worry about doing that. Now, since 2020, so we are so lucky at Iowa State that we went to work day that summer of 2019. We were all really stressed out as staff. I don't know if you were here then, but everything, you were here then. We were still using the little envelopes, yellow envelopes around campus to send, you know, all of our pay requests and our everything around campus. Mm -hmm. Workday is what made us computerized in 2019. I don't know how we would have made it through uh, work remotely without that, because we would have been sending in the mail from our homes um, papers to be signed, right? And all of your documents that you need signed by faculty. So up until 2019, for postdoc positions, for example, those were all recruited by faculty themselves. They would go out and try to find people at conferences to apply for these postdocs. And that was nice. The faculty preferred that, I think. 
But in 2019, Iowa State moved all of the postdoc jobs out to HR. And now to look for a postdoc job, you have to go out to the website just like you were looking for a professional scientific job or a PNS or a merit job or a faculty job. You need to go into the HR job site. Okay. Now on and on LinkedIn, like over the 2020 time, I started seeing postdocs actually up in the search tab. Now every institution I know has postdocs can be found on on LinkedIn. Also, all faculty jobs are now being posted. And it's just been within the last two years that Iowa State has had their own LinkedIn HR site now, and they're making sure they post everything out to LinkedIn. So it's really been within 2020 changed the world and it totally changed the job search world. So everything is found online now. Um, any questions, stop me at any time because I can ramble for a long time. Um, I do this a lot. So a couple other things. I know we have a lot of, whoops, I know we have a lot of international students. So I want to show you that when you're doing this search, it's one of the big complications is how do I find out if they're going to be sponsoring H-1Bs? Up here is a little American flag logo thing. And that is called the ultimate H-1B sponsor. And that is somebody wrote this just about two years ago, and he still has people buying him a coffee. So he still has, that's how he's funded is buying him a coffee with this app. But when you search this, what happens is it comes up and says, this solutions, this company name has not done an H-1B in the last couple of years. Now that doesn't mean it doesn't do H-1Bs. It just means there's no record of one happening in the last couple of years. If you're familiar with H-1Bs, trying to do one also means you have to win the lottery, right? To get into that. So that's also a problem. But it does give you a good idea of maybe I shouldn't start with this company. If I'm an international student, maybe I shouldn't spend as much time. Um, or it means maybe I better go down and look and see, does it say that you have to be a U.S. citizen to even apply for an internship? Because a lot of U.S. positions I'm seeing come up are from NASA, government, Garmin, all these companies that require U.S. citizenship. There are times, though, that some jobs at those companies don't require U.S. citizenship. So look, even though it's a Garmin job, or a black and beach that kind of sounds like it's an aerospace thing, it may be a job that's not one that requires the citizenship. So that's where you really have to look at the job description a lot closely. Don't just look at the title of the company. Um, so that's where you can go in, you can download this, and then when you start pulling this up, you'll see over here, um, sometimes it'll show up over here, um, green or red that they have done H-1Bs. Uh, sometimes it does over here, it kind of as a constantly moving. When he first made this, LinkedIn turned it off really quickly. They didn't like it. Uh, but LinkedIn has let this one stay now on Google Chrome extension, uh, but they haven't bought it from him yet. So he hasn't made that much money. Uh, the new section to LinkedIn that's just in the last six months or so is that they've now added a skills section right here. And what I want you to be very careful about that is here's the job description. You can go in here and you can go and see here's 10 skills. It didn't list them all. You could go in here and add every one of them to your LinkedIn profile. I don't advise you do that because it used to be that I didn't have students having enough LinkedIn skills. And you, so I'd say do at least 15, but you max out at 50 and you want to leave this at like 48 because there might be another one that comes up that you want to add that's like, oh, it's new or whatever. So you don't want to just go through here and just start doing all of them. But it does mean that here's 10 word skills that you do need to start putting into your bullet points, into your titles, into your summaries, maybe your cover letter. They're helping you focus in on the 10 most important skills. So it doesn't mean necessarily that the skills. Now, when I would be looking at this, I would say probably if you have human factors or human factors engineering, one of those two is going to be good. 
right? This means that they're looking for presentations. On your skills, you don't want just hard skills. We want soft skills, interpersonal communication, public speaking, presentations and public speaking would probably both work, okay? Because they're using taxonomies. And so they're saying, well, in order to do presentations, you also have to have public speaking skills. Or if you have presentations, we know you have public speaking skills. So you don't always have to list all of those. The problem is we don't have nice, neat taxonomies that show us all these. Um, but I would say that usability, usability engineering, one of those would be very important because we already have usability twice, right? This job might be more about ergonomics. So maybe that is important for this job, but it may not be something that you have to have the skills for. So just because you don't match all 10 skills doesn't mean you don't qualify to apply. And too often, women and international students are less likely to apply for a job when they're not 95%, okay? But the reality is you can be 50% match and still apply. I'd, I'd rather you apply for the job and have some kind of like, well, I kind of have a little bit of information. You have some, and that's your, as a grad student, you're now an independent learner. You can teach yourself, you're a lifelong learner. And that's what you want to teach tell people as especially an HCI major, major, part of your skills are is teaching yourself new technologies, right? And keeping up on those new technologies. So that's what you really want to emphasize is that, well, you know, I mean, if a new, new job or new program came up next week, you would be looking to see how to get on and how to use it. You're not just going to wait for somebody to teach you. So that's one thing that you want to tell them and let them know you're a self-starter, right? You're innovative. You're going to be looking for how to, what are the newest and greatest things that we need to start watching. That's kind of everything about your major, which I think is really cool. Okay. And that's good to let them know that. And a lot of times they're looking for people. A lot of times the people that write these job descriptions are not the people that are hiring. So the hiring people are like, yeah, I don't know why they have that on there because that's really not that big of a deal. Okay. And that's why when we get to informational interviews, it's really helpful to be able to talk about that. So this is the job description. I just scrolled down a little further. You know, here they're telling us what makes a good fit. They're saying a university degree but they'll hire people that have no degrees with 10, 15 years of experience or even five years of experience doing this because we have a lot of people out there that have grown into these jobs that have just been working in these jobs in other fields and have kind of said, oh, I like to do this and started doing this over the last 10 or 15 years. So they can apply for this job too because they don't have to have the degree, but advanced degrees are preferred. So this is one that I would say a master's or a PhD um, would be good to have. And that means you don't necessarily need that related work experience, okay? You are qualified just by having that graduate degree. Even a bachelor's degree would probably be enough. Um, but they are asking a couple places here, ability to communicate and present effectively. We saw up in the skills was presentations. So this job must have a big component about presenting to other groups, right? Um, ability to multitask and work in fast collaborative work environment. That's pretty much all of our work environments anymore. So we wanna make sure in that skills section that you're not just thinking hard skills. Yes, I know how to do Figma. I know how to do Excel. I know how to do all these other terms, right? But we also know how to collaborate, how to conflicts, uh, problem solve, how to do all these other soft skills. And those are just as important as some of these hard skills. So you can go through, they have the mission, they have their interests. Those might be things that help you create small talk, or it might be a way for you to go, oh, I have a real interest in that same mission. So when I when we talk sometimes about it's a small world, and I know for some international students that might not be a, word, a terminology that you know, but a lot of people will say, oh my gosh, it's a small world. Because I bet if you and I talk, where are you from, Iowa? Cedar Falls. Cedar Falls. So I bet if we talked very long, we're both from Iowa, I bet we could find a connection, right? And we somebody would say, I can't believe you know that person. And I'm like, I can because we're both from Iowa. 
Where'd you go to college? I went here. Okay, so definitely mm -hmm. we're gonna find Iowa State. Okay, we're gonna find some connections. Did you grow up on a farm? No. Okay, you grew up in Cedar Falls. What did your parents do? My dad's an engineer. My mom's a teacher. Where'd she teach? She taught at a small parochial school in Waterloo. Oh, what was the name? St. John St. Nick's. St. John St. Nick's in Waterloo, mm -hmm. Catholic school probably. Mm -hmm. So then look at what I'm doing right now is I'm just doing an informational interview, okay? Now, unfortunately, I'm really bad. I'm so good at this that I'm bad, that I have a hard time having a conversation with people because I literally go through a little checklist in my head to try to figure out how to find somebody. See, I'm from a farm. So if I found out that she was from a farm, I would have said, so who are you in 4-H? Because I was in 4-H, right? So now I would have said, you know, or, did you play sports? You know, um, so trying to figure out what do we have in common with each other to create that ability to develop this professional relationship that feels like we already know each other. Right. And so that's really what we're trying to do when you're networking. You can do that now. It used to be in face to face. Right. We used to have to invite people to lunch. We used to have to go to conferences. Now we get on Zoom or WebEx or Teams and we have a conversation with somebody and we can build that rapport with somebody from around the world. And so that little piece in common may just be that we both attended Iowa State University and now somebody lives in Switzerland. But they say, wow, how is this building doing? And you're like, it's gone. You know, they tore that building down. You're kidding me, what they put there? Oh, they put in the new innovation building. So see, you can start building these conversations just about being an alumni at Iowa State. And that's why I like to start to connect students with alumni, because you have a lot of those things that we know in common. Um, it doesn't matter where you're from around the world, what your major is. So you can talk to an accountant at Garmin Industry that went to Iowa State, and they're still going to be like, oh, wow, I was there long before Jardine was built. Carver used to be the business building. When I was an undergrad, Carver was the business building. So, you know, there's lots of things now to have these conversations about. And that's what this networking is, is creating these conversations. When you look down at the bottom, the total rewards, they're not quite telling us the compensation package, but they are telling us a little bit more about the benefits. I haven't seen that in many job descriptions listed on LinkedIn. However, there's a new law in many states that's called the pay transparency law. There, I think New York has it. So some of them have to list the pay range. So you'll see that now on LinkedIn, you will see a pay range. Some of them were making it so huge at the very beginning that it really wasn't helping us. And they've kind of pulled that in a little. So well, other states it's legal or it's, you have to have it. Some states you don't. Some states you have to have a something in between. I love the fact that we're having more pay transparency because industry has used that as our way of not knowing what to ask for over the years. In America, we don't just necessarily tell what our salary is to the next person, which is how industry has kept us all down with our salaries because we don't want to know that the men in the building are making considerably more than the women doing the same job. That's a fact. That's a proven fact. In other countries, it's very common to tell each other what they're, um, depending on the country, but it's more common to know what the salaries are. Everybody is making the same, whether they're a man or a woman, if you have the same title. Um, so that is starting to really make some industries uncomfortable. They don't like that. Uh, but I think the more as we start to share our salaries with each, with each other, that's going to have that's going to move that bar, right? Um, but it's a real cultural norm in the U.S. not to talk about your salary. Um, and, you know, one is because I don't want to hear that somebody is making 10000 more than me, and I don't know how I'm going to be able to, you know, go to them and make them pay me more. But it's still a part of the solution, I think. Um, in other places we've searched, you know, we talked about that you can go in by people, human factors. Here I just was searching by people. And at the bottom of all the people, here came up some more titles. So now I see ergonomics engineer, usability engineer, human factors, S engineer. Up here I had human 
Oh, I guess I have an S up there, but I would say there's probably human factor and factor. So I just found out today that there was more titles below. So seriously, just keep playing around on LinkedIn because you're going to find all these little places and they change things daily in here. Here's what I do in LinkedIn in networking. When I find a job, the first thing I do is I go in and say, hey, there's one company alumni. Well, the company I'm at right now is Iowa State. So that's an Iowa State alum. And there's a school alumni compared to me. Well, all of my degrees are from Iowa State. So we know that the school alumni is Iowa State. For some of you, that school alumni could have been University of Northern Iowa. It could be a country back uh, your home country um, for your bachelor's degree. It could be a variety. But now you have something in common with these people. And so what I've done is go on and I'll click on those. And with just no, no LinkedIn membership, you can click on and see who those people are. You may not be able to send them an email over here. I've sent an email to people, or you might be able to send like three a month, or you might have to pay for one for a buck or something. So my suggestion is if you are really close to graduating and you're an international student, then it's probably good to go for a pay for that upgraded membership. A lot of times they offer you a free version or a free month. So get two months, right? Do one free month and another paid month and you're going to get two months worth of searching where you can actually send up to 45 of these in mails. And that's what I've done in the past for students. I've been able to do that. Um, now I haven't had time to do that as much, which has been kind of hard. But this is where I send this and you're gonna have this in your stuff. Um, I'll go back to that in a minute. Here's another way you can start to look over here. There's 16 Iowa State alumni. There, I can see I have a connection that works at that. So if you were to on here and you can reach out to me and be a, a connection with me on LinkedIn, if you see that you're a second degree connection and you see I'm connected to somebody, you could always message me on LinkedIn and say, hey, do you happen to know this? Now, I have over 3,500 connections um, because I worked with a lot of graduate students over the last many years. But I'll tell you that I have now a lot of Iowa State alumni that are all working. And those students are where you were some at one point, and they're all like, you can tell students to message me. I'd be happy to talk to them, doing what I keep talking about this informational interview. So, you know, send me a message on LinkedIn. Karen, do you know this person? I might say, you know, my connection is through professional associations. I don't have a direct, but I, my suggestion is it never hurts to try, okay? It never hurts to try. and. You're, the worst you're going to hear is no. Um, I usually just don't hear anything. And that's not always, and that's where you don't want to take that personally, because it's not necessarily that they don't want to talk to you. They may not be on LinkedIn enough to have turned on that you get an email about it. Um, they may not go on. They may not even know how to go out and find those messages. If you look and see they only have 60 connections or they only have 200 connections, they're probably not using LinkedIn. But if they have over 500 LinkedIn connections, now you know they're going to be more active and they're going to be getting some emails and know a little bit more how to use it. So don't take it personally. Also, they may be on vacation. They may be on deadlines. Their first priority is not responding to you. It doesn't mean that they don't care and they wouldn't love to talk to you. They just don't have time. Right. So I see a lot of students that really take that personally and you just can't take it personally. Uh, but this is where you want to just start searching around. And yes, my kids sometimes call me a stalker. Right. We're not that we're researchers. We're um, we're researching connections and trying to find people that would be able to give us more information about that career. So what we want you to do is be able to reach out to people that are working in these fields so that you can say, how did you make that transition from academia to industry? How did you find that job? Um, what did you, what was the best thing that somebody told you to do? You know, there's all these things. I'm gonna quickly, I've given you had highlights. I'm not gonna go over all this, but these are just how to create a good LinkedIn that's going to be screened. And the reason I wanna talk about this is that this top section is read by the computer and humans, 
Okay, we really need the computer to read this for the algorithms because it's going to get those keywords. If this person had put this uh, pipe or this vertical line or a star and put them together with no spaces, that means the person, the comp computer programmer, the coding person would have had, would have had to written molecular with the line before it and then an M. They didn't. They wrote a space before and after, just like we do whenever we type, right? We always put a space in between those words. So that's why you want to have a space between all of your words everywhere you put them in your LinkedIn and your resume, because that's how the computer is programmed to read those. You do want it to connect to the university over here, because this is going to connect to an algorithm that you went to Iowa State University. You could connect it to your college. My suggestion is not to suggest to put to your college here. This is where you're currently working and this is where your highest degree is from. So my suggestion is to really use this area. Now, some degrees, maybe college, IV of business, um, maybe they want to have somewhere on there having in one of their experiences be College of Ivy of Business because they like their college. They're very proud of their college, right? HCI, you're a part of a lot of colleges. So claim Iowa State. As you continue to go down, here's where we've done this qualitative researcher, graduate research assistant. Um, that's how they've distinguished that person. So they're looking at qualitative. Yours might be UX designer, graduate research assistant, or UX designer, graduate student that you could do for your own research. Um, we even have this person, I really like this because they've even had their highlights, right? Recognitions. So they did here at Iowa State Student Innovation Center, they were an innovation fellow and change maker innovation design sprint participant, right? I love this. I know this student very well. He's a PhD student. And I think this is fabulous use of, a, of an award or an honor that he got to be a part of, but he also used it as a job because in LinkedIn and on your resume, you need to show all of your experiences. So even though they're not paid, you still want them to show up here. Okay, but this because this is how we're showing you have experience in those areas. So it's not necessarily paid, it's educational work, it's all experiences. We go down to skills section where I want to highlight this is you can break it down and look at all or you can break it down by all these areas. Some people only have industry in here. I want to make sure that you have at least one skill under interpersonal, a skill under tools and technologies and under industry. You can't determine that, LinkedIn determines that. So at the very top, when you say what field and study you're in, that's where it starts to figure out if you're in an industry or not in an industry. But you can go in and take these exams and they have those under industry and tools and technologies. And these are very good because what happens is if you were to pass this Java, let's say, now when the algorithms are sorting out who has the most experience, somebody has requested Java, they're going to put you ahead of anybody else that has Java on their skills because you've passed that LinkedIn qualification. And these exams are not that easy. They're very theoretical. They're very high profile, high level thinking. And I've even had PhDs that struggle with R and some of those because they're very theoretical. They're not application of how to do the programming. They're very high level, even the word. I got in here and I do word all the time. I've done it for 100 years, right? I was like, I'm going to back out. I'm not going to finish that test because I don't think I'm going to pass it because you can only try it twice. And I don't know if they let you after a year or two come back and try it again. But from here, it tells you you can only do. But you can start to practice and kind of see how you're going to do. But if you pass those, that is going to skyrocket your algorithms on your LinkedIn. So as these recruiters are out searching, and if you have a skill that you've gotten the, the assessment from, it's going to move you way ahead of everybody else when they're searching for people. Um, this is the message that I was talking about when I do the in-mail. So I've actually given you the copy of what I use to introduce students to other people. You can just make this your own. And what you're doing is you're telling them, I would really like to connect with you to learn more about how you found a job, 
uh, what suggestions you might have, not if you have a job available in your company. And what I've usually done is attached a copy of that reverse chronological resume, really plain resume, and then attach a copy of a handout that I've created that's called what is an informational interview. And so one side talks about what an informational interview is. The other side you're going to get a copy of has a sample template invitation email, sample questions to ask them, and a sample thank you email. And so you can do this all on your own by reaching out to people and do it in an in-mail or do it as an email if you have their email. But I like attaching that informational interview handout. I've had many times business people that I don't know that have responded and said, the only reason I'm responding is because you told me what they're going to ask me and they're not going to ask me for a job. I said, yep. I said, you're you're welcome to not respond if they ask you for jobs because I tell people don't do that, right? Because they're going to get the door shut. So um, that's really helped. Just a time check. We only yeah. have a few minutes left. I know, a few <laughs> minutes. I'm sorry. So I have a lot of slides that um, are actually at the end of this that I don't even plan to go over. Um, I just put a few things on career fairs. Just know that virtual career fairs are very, very big right now. A lot of people are going back to in-person. Most of those um, decisions for internships are made, you're gonna be able to get this online, um, are made in the fall. So for the fall career fair, you wanna be ready to look for internships and jobs because sometimes they're hiring those higher level positions. Uh, there's a variety of places to look. This is a professional development as far as what the graduate college offers. We have career services, we have the CCE, the Communication Excellence. We just moved to a new, a new um, format. So starting July 1, we're going to have Preparing Future Faculty and CERTL are all going to come over the, under the Graduate College Professional Development umbrella. And then we've had Emerging Leader, but that also is going to be a part of uh, the professional development office that is a new office that we're calling at um, the Graduate College. This talks quickly about what a career what a career search would be, and this would just be some other job search sites: LinkedIn, Glassdoor. Uh, those are all places to go. Now, if we had more time, here's where I have this information for informational interview. So I've given you all that. You're going to have the handout, and then you're going to see all these other because there's so much in here that I've given you all the details of how to put together a LinkedIn profile. OK, because once I start talking about it, I know that's what you're going to want to do. And so if you have any questions at all, you can email me at this um, grad careers email. I am not doing one on one coaching right at the moment because I'm building um, a program for consultants to train consultants. So by fall, we hope to have not just me providing one-on-one, -on -one, but also graduate consultants that are hired to provide one-on-one, -on -one, kind of like the Center for Communication Excellence is having. Um, but I'm doing group works, I'm doing a lot of programs, and I have a lot of recordings of how to do a resume, how to do more on LinkedIn, how to do an interview that you're welcome to watch. So I know I've been talking, I'm so sorry, but um, are there any questions in the chat? No questions in the chat. Um, I might throw out one and I guess my audio wants, you might have to repeat my question. Sure. Um, but we have quite a few students that are either online, um, maybe they're working full time right. while pursuing this degree. Do you have any quick pointers for them about how to um, kind of sell that past work experience, maybe jump from one place to another, given they might have time working in a similar industry, but not exactly HCI. Yeah, and I think actually somebody who's working right now, that's you're really at a great advantage because you can go in now and upgrade, update your resume. And um, employers always like when you currently have a job. They'd much more, it seems like recruiters hire people much quicker when you're currently working than when you're unemployed. So when you're looking, that's why we want to make your job as a student look like you have a job, right? We call it a job. But if you're currently working, you know, it's a matter of connecting with people around the office, around the company that are doing those titles, uh, letting people know that you have these new skills and getting involved in asking for new duties say look i just took a i just took a class i know how to do this 
can I be a part of this? So talking to your faculty, or your faculty, but talking to your supervisors, talking to people in those departments and start making friends with them and saying, hey, I just taken a class on this. I'd love to be a part of this team. They probably would love to have you come in because you might have more current information than they do. So it's asking. There's also a question in the chat, and I'll have you repeat it again. Oh, I have my microphone on. Yes, I'm okay. sorry. I didn't repeat that last uh, time. There's a question. Is there another place at college where we could get a one-on-one -on -one consultation? Um, can you repeat the question? Yes. Is there another place at Iowa State that you can get a one-on-one -on -one consultation? Uh, depending, each of the colleges have career service offices. So engineering has career services. Um, design, they all have career service counselors there. Uh, some of them aren't as focused really on graduate students, um, especially a PhD. So if you are, you know, I'm, I'm weak. So if you're really in need of something, I will probably figure out a time that I could meet with you in the next couple of weeks, especially if you're graduating in May and you're really panicking. Um, send me an email at that grad careers and say urgent and say why it's urgent. Um, some people have interviews coming up. Some people are trying to negotiate. A lot of times we can just talk on the phone or talk on a quick Zoom meeting and get through things or email me a copy of your resume in this the code, you're going to find a copy of my Word document resume that I say is the ugly version that you can use and copy exactly to use for your resume, uh, the informational interview. So all of the things that I talked about today, you're going to be able to go in and update things. And then you could always email and say, hey, can you take a look at this? And I hope to be able to have time to look at some of those things. But you can also check within the college career services offices. Some of those might have advisors that feel comfortable with working with that majors. But I am kind of weak when it comes to that because I like working with students. So, And I'm just going to say, Angeline over here, I know our time is short, but I just want to say, Angeline is a student that I've worked with. And uh, she just told me before we got here that, she now has an internship. She accepted an internship in Oklahoma City as a UX, what was the title? UI UX designer. UI UX designer, which I'm thrilled about because she and I worked a lot on her resume and LinkedIn. And she was saying that really once she made these changes to your LinkedIn, that is when you started to hear from recruiters and see activity on your job on your program, your profile, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, she says yes, for those of you who don't, don't see her. <laughs> I have to repeat. Um, so I was really thrilled to see her come in today. It makes me feel really good. I love it when you guys can get jobs. Let me know. Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. If you guys learn of new things that are coming up that I need to know about in the job search, please tell me because I want to stay on top of what's current. And like I said, I'm not a coder and I'm not a programmer. So I just try to figure it out from my point of view. Uh, but it really is working. Angeline can tell you it works. And I have a lot of other students that can tell you just a few changes on your LinkedIn will get you, start getting you some people asking about you, okay? Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just, I could go on for hours, but I tried to, I knew I would be at the end. So that's why this PowerPoint is always full, stocked full of a ton of other information. Okay, great. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.